And I would ask you, if you would, to open your text of Scripture to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. Now, it is a very familiar parable. Uh, but it is also, in my opinion, the essence of the missionary task. That is what we are doing as God's people on mission in this world. So, let me just begin with uh, verse 1. On that day, Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. A great multitude gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole multitude was standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And he sowed some seeds that fell beside the road. The birds came and ate them up. Others fell upon the rocky places where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched. Because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop some hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Here's a key, key text. He who has ears, let him hear. So clearly Jesus is saying, now there are some important truths in this parable that need to be understood, embraced, and applied. I would ask you just to turn your attention a little further down there to verse 18, where Jesus gives us the clear interpretation of what he just said in this previous reading. Verse 18 says the following, Hear then the parable of the sower. Anyone who hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom the seed was sown beside the road. The one on whom the seed was sown on, on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately falls away. And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worries of the world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But verse 23 should call our attention. And the one on whom the seed was sown on the good soil, now this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Let's ask God's blessing upon the reading of his word. Lord, it is with joyful hearts we're here with your people this day, lifting our hearts in worship to you, joining our hearts in prayer and praise to you. Speak to us now from your word. Inform us. Encourage us. Deploy us to greater engagement, alignment, and involvement with your mission among all peoples in all places this day. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As I look at the text of Scripture we have just read in Matthew's Gospel, we see a parable that clearly is saying three essential things resumes uh, our summary of the task God has given his people in this world today. The first truth we see in this parable is before us is the greatest challenge before us in the day in which we live, and that is lostness. As we look at a world filled with problems and challenges and difficulties, and we attempt to try to summarize and rank in importance what are the greatest needs which we are faced with. 
We can think of many. We can think of global climate change. We could think of uh, economic difficulties, uh, rising inflation. We can think of, of violence to be found in our cities and in places. We can think of various forms of human savagery and brutality. And we could easily say, yes, all of these things are serious concerns that should call our attention. But when we ask ourselves, what is the greatest problem? What is the root that lies behind all of these problems to which we have uh, addressed and, and consider this day? The question the Bible gives us, oh, or the answer which Scripture gives us is always the greatest need which we are faced with this day is lostness. People do not know their maker and redeemer. And until people know their maker and their redeemer, we can attempt solutions for what we feel to be are the greatest needs and the greatest problems faced among by humanity to this day and still fail in that which is our greatest need. The reason why the seed must be sown is because Hearts need that seed, that seed of the gospel that brings the hope of salvation, a pardon of, of a new mission in this world, and the glorious hope of life eternal when we die. The greatest need of the world that we face today is lostness. Secondly, the only solution to the problem of lostness is the gospel. Scripture says in Matthew 13, what is this seed that the sower was uh, sowing in these various soils that are described in the first part of chapter 13? Jesus says in, in, with clarity, it is the message of the gospel of the kingdom. Much good can be done and much good should be done in this world. Let there be no question about that. Karen will talk with you this morning about some very good things that are happening in this world by means of the generosity of Southern Baptists committed to doing good things in this world for God's glory. But it's not good things done that will reach the greatest need of the human heart. It is only the proclamation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The simple message that says, you were made in God's image to know him and to accomplish his purpose and plan for your life. And as Rich Pond Baptist Church has evangelized with us in our missionary context, we tell people that on a regular basis. And the second thing we tell them is what? This world is not the way God intended it to be. And I can promise you this much, you might be afraid. You might be afraid when you say, hey, I, I just don't, I don't know whether I could talk with people about the gospel. It's, it is so hard and, and I'm not going to question the difficulty of sharing the gospel in a secularizing context. It is challenging. But I assure you of one thing that I have never heard anyone call into question, and that is, this is a broken world. This is a broken world. And the gospel gives us the answer as to why this world is broken. And that is because our relationship with our creator has been severed by our rebellion. And what then is the solution, the solution we sing about the coming of the Messiah, God with us. Jesus Christ, God of very God, begotten of the Holy Spirit, conceived of the God, born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, who 
entered into the full depths of human suffering, pain, and misery. On the third day, rose from the grave, now sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from which one day he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Now that is the essence of the gospel message. We were made by God for a reason. We are severed from God because of our sin. Christ has come to provide restoration, reconciliation, and propitiation for our sins. And now those who open their hearts to receive that gospel message can have full pardon and justification before the throne of God Almighty. The eternal declaration of salvation is given, forgiven fully, completely in Jesus Christ by faith in Him alone. We now have a mission in this world to glorify God and do good to others and the glorious hope of knowing when we die, we enter into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our greatest of all hopes is that one day, dead or alive, Christ will return again and establish His kingdom of which we will enter for eternity. That is the message that must be proclaimed. Greatest need? Lostness. Only solution? The gospel. Our responsibility together as Southern Baptists, we are taking the gospel in a steadfast, firm way to, uh, to all people in all places needing to hear this gospel message. It is the only application that would be reasonable and responsible when you look at Matthew 13. What is Jesus saying? The gospel must get to these places, to these soils. No, they will not all be the same. Some will be more responsive, some will be less responsive. Each one will have their own challenges, each one will have their own difficulties, but this we know. Where Jesus' name is not known, the mission of God must advance. And that is the teaching of Matthew 13. Now this then leads us to a second thing for us to consider. Our PowerPoint is here. I'd like to show you a few things. If not, I can still talk with you about a few things. And that is the following. How is it that Southern Baptists are joining together to make the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ known among all nations? We do that by reaching the nations together. We can see here when we as Southern Baptists join our resources together to reach the nations together, 100% of your gifts to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering enable gospel transformation among the unreached. Now let's take it a step further. Last year, Southern Baptists in the midst of unprecedented challenges of economic difficulties and, and political uh, uh, trials and tribulations, uh, profound social changes taking place in the United States. Uh, we were blessed to have the largest mission offering in the history of the Southern Baptist Convention. $205 million committed to the advance of God's glo global glory among the nations. That is an unprecedented blessing. That makes the sowing of the seed possible among unreached peoples and unreached places. This year, our uh, goal is $196 million. And when a church like Rich Pond Baptist Church joins forces in prayer, in sacrificial giving, in direct missionary involvement, then the power of God's people come together, make it possible to see a financial offering of $196 million, hopefully even more, possible so that Southern Baptists from churches across the United States of America can deploy to the nations. And the important thing for us to remember this morning is each one of us can be involved in that mission. Now it's just not giving, it's just not going, it's just not praying. It's all three of these factors, all three of these dynamics coming together at the same time. 
Can we move forward with that? Because I'd like to talk with you a little bit. There you go. Just to let you know what happened last year. This is really good news. You can see 3,650 missionaries supported with comprehensive care. Now, Ken's going to tell you a little bit about what that means here in just a second. But that is no insignificant factor. 592,408 people heard the gospel. Many of the part of that number, Karen's going to talk with you how Rich Palm Baptist Church was a part of that, just working with us for one week. But that is all of us as Southern Baptists working together to sow the seed among the nations. Number three, 22,744 new churches established, 176,000 new believers, 107,000 baptisms, 93 new people groups and places engaged, 182,000 people receiving leadership training. Now that is just a snapshot, a global snapshot of what God is doing worldwide. So when you begin to ask that question, well, like, why should I want to be a Southern Baptist? Or why should I want to give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering? Because you are a part of that. And that is good news. That is gospel obedience as we saw in Matthew 13. Let's, let's take a step further here. You have another slide there you can move forward? There we go. I'd like for you to look at that right there. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap my part here before I ask Karen to come and share, talking with you about what you see here. Uh, a lot of folks look at that, they go, is it a tear? No, it's not a tear. Uh, it's a seed. It's a, it's a, it's a, Matthew, it's a, it's a Matthew 13 seed. It represents... The, who we are. Southern Baptists are missionary people. We sow the seed. So I just want to take this few moments here to remind those of you who are veteran Southern Baptists just what it, what it, how, do, how do we do this? How do we go about fulfilling Great Commission obedience? And for those of you who might be new to Southern Baptist life, let me just explain how it works. The first is this, that seed represents who we are as the International Mission Board. The center of that seed is what I have been explaining to you. It is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything we do as Southern Baptists, as the International Mission Board, focuses on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The seed that must be proclaimed among all people, in all places, all types of soils, all types of situations. Gospel at the center. Now, the next thing I want you to note is this. Note the top part of that seed, that curved part of that seed, the, the top part of the husk of that seed that represents the power and the priority of intercessory prayer. I hope you have been in prayer for international missions last week. Be in prayer for international missions every week. But the work of God always goes forward based on the prayers of God's people. When you pray for missions, your prayers are a part of how God chooses to advance His kingdom among all peoples in all places. Yes, the financial offering is a blessing. It's, it's the means by which we deploy Southern Baptists to the nations. But we are keenly aware, first and foremost, God's work is done in God's way, and God's way is God's people pray for God's work to advance. Below that, the center, where you see the center, the gospel, you'll also then see in that image what would be a mountain. That represents the gospel going to all of the earth. There are literally billions of people who still have not had a gospel witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are still numerous unreached and unengaged people groups that must be advanced 
uh, uh, that must be reached with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the vision of Southern Baptist is that our God is worthy of being glorified among all peoples in all places. Well, how will we do that? And I am going to finish my part here and let Karen in a few moments tell you how we are doing that practically. The bottom of that seed represents how we're doing it. And that is by means of mutual cooperation among Southern, like-minded Southern Baptist churches across the United States of America. The foundation of our missions efforts are like-minded Baptists joining hearts, minds, souls, and resources with the common vision of the gospel going to all people and all places. Now I know right now you're probably thinking, well, how does that look like in practice? When a church sends missionaries, is directly involved in missions, is praying, what does it look like when that actually takes place in a concrete, real world in which we live? Well, Karen, why don't you come and share with us what that can look like, or what that does look like, and what that can look like for each one of us as we're engaged in God's mission. All right. Well, good morning. Uh, you know, when we start talking about Lottie Moon and the cooperative program and the generosity of Southern Baptists, our hearts cannot help but be filled with gratitude. We are so thankful for you. We are so thankful for your support, your prayers, your offerings, your participation with us. And I'm going to talk just in a minute about some of the folks from Ridgepond who came and worked with us and what a blessing that was. But let me start just a little bit giving you some practical applications for exactly what the money you give really is used for. Now we've talked about two things. We've talked about cooperative program and the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, right? So a cooperative program, every Sunday when you give your offering, a portion of that goes to the cooperative program. So I'm going to talk about those pictures, but I, go ahead and keep looking at them while I talk. All right, that'll help you understand things a little bit better. So the cooperative program, that's the consistent support base that all your missionaries across the world receive. That takes care of things like our salary, our health care, our housing, our mission provided vehicle, things that help us stay on the field. Now, the average cost for a missionary worldwide to live on the field is $60,000 a year. That's just what it costs to get us there and keep us there. And that's the average. Now, let's just think about that just a minute. That's $60,000 just to keep us there. All right, I'm going to throw some numbers at you, but stick with me. According to the IMB's website, we currently have 13,680,493 Southern Baptists. That's a lot of Southern Baptists. Of that huge number, the number that actually attends on a semi-regular weekly basis drops down to about 3 million. 607,530. So let's just take that number, that 3 million plus. What do each of those 3 million plus people need to give to keep one missionary on the field for a year? Well, that comes down to about $5 a month. Everyone who's regularly in church, if you were to give $5 per month, you would help support one missionary family. Now, that puts your cooperative program money uh, in perspective a little bit. Let me give you an example of a young lady that we met 30 years ago. Her name is Vicki. And Vicki took that challenge years ago, and she said, I'd like to support a missionary family. So Vicki began years ago supporting a, a missionary family, in her mind, giving $8 a week in addition to her offering. She said, I'm going to give $8 a week in addition to my cooperative program offering, but as a separate Lottie Moon offering. 
She then added on, after a couple years, not only $8 a week for Lottie Moon, but she said, I think I'm going to start giving $7 a week to Annie Armstrong for home missions. A few years went on, and she said, I think I'm going to start adding $6 a week to the Kentucky Baptist Convention. And a few years later, she said, I feel I need to add $5 a week to my associational missions. And so Vicki gives that amount of money every week out of her paycheck, so she's consistently giving to the cooperative program, to Lottie Moon, to Annie Armstrong, to KBC, and to associational missions. It's just a simple way for her to keep track of how she's doing it. What do we use that money for? The Lottie Moon money, the Lottie Moon money is to support the ministries. So cooperative program gets us there doing what we do, but Lottie Moon helps us do what we do in ministry. Now the pictures you're seeing there are from an event this past July. We had a group of four people from Rich Pond who came and ministered alongside us. Now, I don't know what you think about missions teams, but let me tell you what we think about missions teams. We love them. That's right. And we need them because we don't provide tourism activities for you. You provide catalyst for ministry for us. That's right. And so what you see here was a strategic use of volunteers, both at our church plant, here from Rich Pond and us, strategically engaged in projects. Every project you see there, and I'll tell you about it just in a second, every project you see there was an opportunity to share the gospel. Every person you see had the gospel shared with them. Now we talked about gospel shares, and so Mark and I try to set an annual goal just for us every year. How many gospel conversations will we intentionally try to have? Now, it's not that we're getting paid more or less for having more or less conversations, but you set a goal so you know if you're, if you're doing what you, what you feel you ought to be doing, right? So we set a goal to have 80 gospel conversations this year. Now, that's 80 conversations sharing our faith and talking to someone intentionally about the gospel. Now, 80 conversations, guys, that's a pretty good goal, Right? But because you all sent a team to work with us in an intensive week of evangelism, I'm not even counting their conversations. Our annual goal, instead of being 80, we had 168 conversations. Half of those, one half of those conversations the week that you all were with us. So what does that mean? That means your presence opens doors for us. Yes, we live there. Yes, we're intentionally ministering. But your presence, you can see here, it's a big event. It's exciting when Americans come to town. We're going to do big things. We're going to make 350 pancakes there you go. to feed kids who are hearing the gospel message. We're going to do jujitsu. We're going to do soccer camps. We're going to have activities. This young man next to Mark there, that's a, that's a lay leader he has trained to share the gospel. The young man on the other side of him is one, well, the other two are two of his students. These are folks that are working with us on site. The community we work in is a rough community. It's very poor. You can see, you've seen some of the pictures up there, some of the houses the actual houses there, the average house there, is about the size of an American kitchen. Add on a small bathroom, and that's about the size of the house. There might be 10, 12 people who live in that house. There might be a bed or two, maybe a couple chairs. Definitely not room for everybody at one time. That's the community we're at. You can see here some of the martial arts classes. Uh, we provide these activities at the church's activity center to get the kids off the street, to get the young men off the street. That's our neighborhood. The neighborhood is a neighborhood that is uh, characterized by drug abuse, violence, murder, prostitution, and all that 
encompasses. The, the most lucrative legal activity is the collection of trash for recycling. These are the people that we work with. The ministry center provides opportunities for the kids to come off the street, for the young men to have something to do with their time in a productive way. Every person who comes through the ministry center hears the gospel every day, in every way. And so the pictures you're seeing there are what folks from Rich Pond were able to do with us. Now, a couple things happened that week. Because of the, the influx of extra people, the planning for the extra projects, we were able to use that as a cat catalyst to start some other ministries. One of the things we'd been trying to do there was a ladies' Bible study. We just couldn't get it off the ground. We tried several times, it just didn't take, take place. The women came, we did a ladies Bible study talking about trauma healing. Now I was thinking this morning about the tornadoes that ripped through here a year ago. And you can, you understand, you understand trauma, right? Trauma is when your world is turned upside down and, and you're surrounded by hopelessness and you don't know how you're ever going to get back to a sense of normal. That's what our people live with every day. Drug abuse, violence, death, murder. It's trauma, and it's trauma every day. So we began praying about an opportunity to launch a trauma healing ministry, beginning with our ladies. I tried for several months. I just couldn't get it off the ground. The ladies of Rich Pond, who are with me, we began doing some of the narrative stories talking about the life of Joseph and teaching how Joseph had gone through several traumatic moments in his life. As a result of that, the Rich Pond team went home. The ladies began talking with me, and they began saying, can we keep talking about this stuff? This was really helpful this last week. It would be so nice if we could keep doing this. I was invited to go into one of the homes and lead a 12-week Bible study. I had eight ladies present consistently. One of the ladies I was able to train to lead further studies. So here's what happened, and here's what's so exciting. And this is how you know Rich Pond is truly making disciples, all right? They saw us during the week working together to tell the Bible narratives. So when I went to train the ladies there in the community, I said, I need someone who I can train who will learn how to tell the Bible stories with me. Janaini was one who was willing to be trained. Now, she doesn't read very well, maybe at a second grade level. So she's not comfortable with written material. So one week I had to be gone. And I asked her, I said, Janaini, can you tell the Bible story this week? I said, you remember it, right? Well, I don't know all the details. I said, I'll send it to you. Here it, here it is printed, because I know she can read, right? I said, I'll give you the printed text. No, I'm just not comfortable doing it. I said, well, what if I read it into my phone and send it to you via WhatsApp? Will you listen to it? She said, oh, yeah, that'll work. So I sent her the Bible story via her phone, she listened to it numerous times until she memorized it, and then she led the Bible study. So the next day I called her and I said, well, how did it go? You led the Bible story by yourself tonight, or last night, how was it? And she said, well, I think it was okay. Okay, well, tell me about it. She said, yeah, two ladies accepted Christ. I said, well, well, I think it's okay, too. Tell me about it. What happened? She said, well, I listened to the story over and over till I could remember all the details. And then when I got there, I told them the story, and I asked them some questions. And they couldn't answer all the questions. So I said, well, let me just tell it to you again. So I told it to them the second time. And I said, do you think you can answer questions? And they said, well, could you tell it once more? So I told it the third time. And I told it, and I asked questions, and I told it a fourth time, and I told it a fifth time, and each time I asked more questions. And by the time I got done, one of the ladies said, I want that. 
I want that Jesus. Can you help me find him? And before I could pray with her, another one said, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. I want that Jesus too. That's making disciples. Amen. And I couldn't have done that myself without your help. And Janaini couldn't have done it without your help. And those ladies now can share the gospel in a way that's natural for them because they've heard the story, they understand the story, and it makes sense to them. We can't do that without you. And we thank you for your support. Well, as we conclude, let's remember where we have been this morning. We've looked at God's Word, Matthew 13. We've discovered that the three most important truths to be found in that passage is lostness is our greatest need, gospel is the only solution, our responsibility is to get the gospel to all peoples and all places. We talked about what it is to be the International Mission Board, Southern Baptist on Mission with God. We're in prayer for missions. We're focused on the gospel. We go to all people in all places, and together, joining our resources, hearts, minds, souls, together, we're seeing the gospel advance. And you have just heard what Rich Palm Baptist Church has personally been doing in being a part of the numbers you saw up there, going to hard places in Brazil. But this, I would conclude saying this, Pastor Steve, you heard one story, one. We could tell you another hundred stories. 3,600 3, missionaries could tell you hundreds of stories equal to what you've just heard around the world. That is the power of God working through the people of God committed to the mission of God. I'd ask you for you to stand with me at this time as Pastor Steve comes forward to conclude our service today. But I would like to ask Pastor Steve, we have a special moment of prayer as well for the greatest challenge, in my opinion, that Southern Baptist and the International Mission Board faces over the next five years. And that is, there are going to be a lot of old codgers, 30 years <laughs> and more experience. They'll be looking at retirement. And we need to be in prayer that God raises up, this is the challenge of Dr. Paul Chitwood, that God would raise up five hundred new Southern Baptist missionaries from Southern Baptist churches to deploy in and through the International Mission Board. All of us have a part in God's mission, but some need to be called to go and invest their lives. And I will say the most fearful thing I will say to this group today, that could well be your child or your grandchild. Prioritize prayer to that end. We need a new generation of young Southern Baptists committed to God's global glory among all peoples in all places. And I'm convinced that this church is a seedbed by which the seed will be spread among the nations. Pastor Steve, thank you for this privilege this day.